Greetings from Microlab Northwest. Today we're going to take a look at the EpiLight Illuminator that provides dark field illumination. Now, why do we need dark field illumination? When we think about it, all of the images that we're accustomed to seeing in our everyday life are the result of reflected dark field illumination. When we read the page of a book, the words show up because we've illuminated the page with dark field reflected light. It's the reflected light coming off that surface that allows us to see the words. The same thing is true of when we look at fruit. We can assess the ripeness by the light that's reflected off that fruit. When we look at ourselves in the mirror, it's the light reflected off of us that we're looking at reflected again in the mirror. All of these are reflected dark field illumination. Why do we need reflected dark field illumination when we're looking at particles under the microscope? There are a lot of particles that are opaque. Opaque doesn't mean black. For instance, a pink flake. It looks black, but with reflected dark field illumination, we can see the color of the pink flake and recognize it as something other than, say, charred plant matter. When we look at wear metal, we will see all kinds of structure with reflected dark field illumination that allows us to determine what kind of wear was occurring, what made the metal particle form. Similarly, there are a lot of natural minerals that are dark, that are opaque. Reflected light may show us colors that we didn't expect. Many spores, fungal spores, are opaque with transmitted light. With reflected light, we can see that they are, in fact, black, perhaps, or dark brown. If we are looking at a sphere that appears black, that can be a number of things. It can be a negrospore, a fungal spore. It can be a cenosphere that's emission from, say, a diesel engine. Or it could be a magnetite sphere from some kind of metal operation. All of those things look different under reflected dark field illumination. If we're just using transmitted light, they're all black spheres. So it's important that we have reflected dark field illumination. If reflected dark field illumination is so important, then why not buy a reflected light microscope instead of a transmission light microscope? On the micro scale, most things are transparent. One of the unique advantages of light microscopy is that we can actually see how a beam of light is changed as it travels through the material. That gives us all kinds of information about the structure inside that particle. We'll see structures internally that you can never see with an SEM. A scanning electron microscope only looks at the surface. It can't see all the detail that's inside the particle. So we need really both. We need transmitted and reflected dark field illumination. One of the difficulties with getting reflected dark field illumination is that we don't have a nice attachment, an inexpensive attachment, an affordable attachment, to give us that reflected dark field illumination. Well, we designed one. This is a ring light that fits around the objective, fits around most standard objectives. We can fit that around the transmitted light objective, position it so that we optimize the reflectivity off of our specimen, and then use these nylon nuts 
to tighten it in position so that it's once it's fixed we can go from one sample to another and we get the same reflectivity. The ring light is fairly easy to attach to the microscope. We have one already on this microscope. You can see we've attached it. It has the cord that comes off of the ring light. That's attached to a controller cord. And the controller cord we attach to a power pack. Or we can attach it to our laptop in order to get the power we need to turn it on. And here you can see that we now have light coming from our epi illuminator. Now in order to position it correctly, we need to use the metal flake slide that comes with the kit. The metal flake slide is simply a slide containing a number of small iron metal flakes that have been slightly oxidized so that their reflectivity is about the same as you might expect from a charred uh, plant material. When we set the microscope up, we're going to focus on those metal particles, get them in sharp focus, and then we have to set up the substage condenser so that it's in the correct position to give us the optimal illumination of the specimen. The position of the substage condenser is determined by focusing the illuminating beam on the substage condenser iris. It's hard to get underneath the microscope to look and see that we've got that focused. So what we're going to do instead, we're going to use the field iris, which is this iris in the base of the microscope. This iris in the base of the microscope <coughs> gives us uh, an image that we can then adjust. We can first use our substage condenser focus knob to bring that into focus. And then <coughs> we use the centering pins under the substage condenser iris to center that image. At this point, we have what is basically color illumination. We'll have another section on color illumination and how you, in fact, set that up in greater detail. But for right now, that's sufficient for what we're doing here. So once we have our ring light on and adjusted, we've got our illumination set, we can start looking at environmental particles. Now, what do we see when we look at environmental particles? We see a number of things. One of them is that we'll see all of the different sources that impact that environment. Some of those sources may be biological, like pollen, something that was created just hours before, perhaps. We may also see minerals. Some of those, like zircon, may be as old as the planet Earth itself. All of these things are modified by the way they move through the atmosphere, by the effects of the environment on them through time, and by the result of their sitting on that surface for some interval of time. All of these things show up as either the morphology of the particle, and that includes fine detail on the surface of the particle. It shows up by the physiochemical properties of the particle and also by the interface between the mounting medium and the edge of the particle itself. Those create different effects and those effects 
can provide a tremendous amount of information on the source of the particle, how it was created, how it moved through the environment, and how long, perhaps, it has been sitting on the surface from which we collected it. There are a number of things that we can do to take samples. You might, for instance, start with Scotch Clear Tape. Scotch brand Clear Tape, that's the one in the red plaid dispenser. I'm not selling, <laughs> I don't have stock in Scotch, but uh, it turns out that it has some properties that we'll talk about later that make it a reasonably good choice for a clear tape. But if you take the clear tape and apply it, for instance, to the uh, trunk of your car, the hood of your car, or the windshield of your car, or to the dashboard in front of the steering wheel, all of those samples are environmental samples that will tell you something about where the vehicle has been, what kind of environment it's been seeing, and what is the difference between exterior particulate and interior particulate. You can take a sample off the top of the refrigerator. You can take a sample off the windowsill inside and the windowsill outside and look at the difference in the types of particles that occur there. When you take that tape lift sample with clear tape and put it down on a microscope slide, you'll notice that quite often air bubbles around the particles interfere with your ability to see the image of the particle correctly. There's a way around that. Instead of just putting it directly on the microscope slide, you can add a mounting medium. That mounting medium can be a little oil. It can be even something like clear corn syrup. You put that down on the slide and then you put the tape down on top of that, you'll find that you've gotten rid of most of the air bubbles. Unfortunately, that's not a permanent mount. If you want a permanent mount, you have to use a mounting medium that cures over time or with UV light and uh, will form a good permanent mount. That's something that you can come back to to check yourself, to check the identity of the particles, to uh, do a variety of things. That makes a library of particles for your own personal collection. Well, that pretty much covers what we were going to cover today. So until next time, we'll see you later.